Prior to World War II, the U.S. area of control in the far Pacific was limited. The island of Guam in the Marianas Group had been under American rule since the U.S. victory in the Spanish-American War in 1898. For some 40 years, the Guamanians led relatively peaceful, uneventful lives as American subjects. But only a hundred miles from Guam, the Japanese were conducting a different kind of administration. On Tinian and Saipan and the other Marianas, the islanders worked hard for their Asiatic masters. In the late 1930s, the Western Pacific was dominated by the rapidly expanding Japanese empire. That expansion continued to the bursting point. The war with Japan had several memorable turning points, all directly affecting the final outcome. In the struggle for the Marianas in the summer of 1944, the enemy's leaders realized that if U.S. forces were successful at Saipan, Japan could prepare itself for eventual defeat. In Hawaii, the troops scheduled to see action in the Marianas prepared to embark on the journey to the target. General Ralph Smith commanded the Army's 27th Division, one of the three divisions earmarked for the campaign on Saipan. During the last days of May 1944, the men became part of the Northern Troops and Landing Force assigned to the Saipan operation. By the 1st of June, the last elements of the divisions which would oppose the enemy on Saipan were aboard ship, and Operation Forager was begun. While the attack force was en route, word of the landings on the beaches of Normandy came through. But the assault forces on the ships were occupied with their own invasion, a campaign just as vital to final victory in the Pacific as the Normandy invasion was to the European triumph. Three days before D-Day on Saipan, scout planes flew reconnaissance missions to search out any enemy naval force. The men were briefed thoroughly on the principal features of the landing area. The task force neared the objective. Before dawn on D-Day, the carrier planes were readied for their last pre-invasion strikes. planes continued to work over the target in the teeth of enemy flak. From all appearances, the battle ahead looked like a tough one. provided a staccato introduction to the invasion. The Navy had a wide range of targets to concentrate on. The naval guns worked overtime. Now and then they had to be cooled off before going back into action. With each hour less than an hour away, the assault force of marines who were to carve out the beachhead on Saipan prepared for one more landing against a carefully entrenched enemy. No matter how often a marine went ashore against heavy enemy opposition, each new landing seemed just as tough or tougher than the last.
Even veterans like Marine Private First Class Harry Jackson of Pitchfork, Wyoming, never got really used to the feeling that went with going in on an enemy beach. After a couple of tough landings, you couldn't help figuring that the law of averages was working against you. In a way, it was a good feeling to be on solid ground again, but that meant you were wide open. Even though your buddies were all around, you felt all alone on a beach like Saipan. At least on this one, the men got into the beach. That hard ball in the pit of your stomach never left until you saw the first guy near you get hit. That did it. You wanted to even the score for the guys who got it. Saipan was rough right from the word go, and this time there was a lot more island to take than there was on some of those atolls. The first few hours on the island gave us a good idea of what the campaign was going to be like. Somebody said the 2,000 Marines got hit that first day. Nobody doubted it. They finally called for some more support from the cans offshore. And the Zoomies gave us a hand once in a while, too. first couple of days, we had a pretty good idea the place was ours, with no ifs, ands, or buts. Then we moved on in to take over a real chunk of the island. But it wasn't any cinch. tanks were handy to have around. Sometimes you'd be able to save a guy who got hit bad using the tank as a shield. Speaking of things that were handy to have around, those rockets weren't just whistling Dixie. By D-Day plus three, we'd taken Aslito Airfield, the enemy's most important air base on the island. The Japs had really had it at Aslito. They pulled out awful fast. By June 18th, a sizable area had been seized by the assault marines of the 2nd and 4th Divisions, assisted, beginning on the second day, by GIs of the Army's 27th Division. After Aslito Field had been taken by the soldiers, land-based planes in considerable numbers could be used in support of the drive north on the island. The three divisions, two marine, one army, worked abreast up the island. On Saipan, both sides used tanks. In general, American mediums proved superior to the Japanese variety. In one pitched battle lasting three and a half hours, 31 enemy tanks were knocked out. The enemy counterattack had been successfully beaten off. 
But the fight to gain control of the southern sector of Saipan had taken its toll of assault troops. During the first week of the campaign, the U.S. invasion force suffered some 6,000 casualties. In the campaign to gain control of this valuable cornerstone of the enemy's defense perimeter. The day before D-Day, the U.S. naval force off Saipan learned that a Japanese fleet was moving into the Philippine Sea off Saipan's west coast to contest the invasion. The enemy naval force raced east from the Philippines, but was met by a strong U.S. armada in the Philippine Sea. U.S. carrier pilots could scarcely wait for this chance to close with the Japanese fleet. pilots headed straight for the enemy force. The Japanese ships were prepared for a battle, but not for the one that was shaping up in the Philippine Sea. The Japanese gun crews looked forward to a good day's shooting. The enemy fleet was well set for the engagement when the first contact was made. swarmed all over the Japanese fleet. Enemy planes fought back desperately. group began losing its planes in some numbers. The U.S. air complement suffered some casualties too. But the enemy was overwhelmingly beaten in the two-day battle in the Philippine Sea, which came to be known as the Marianas Turkey Shoot. The enemy threat to the beachhead on Saipan was completely dissipated. Of the 216 American planes which pursued the fleeing enemy ships, about half returned safely to their home carrier. Not all escaped unscathed. Some pilots were born lucky. Some of the men who made a U.S. victory possible had fought their last battle. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Unto Almighty God we commend the soul of our brother departed, and we commit his body to the deep. Ensure and certain hope of the resurrection unto eternal life. Amen. Once more, the Pacific received its dead. In the battle off the Marianas, the enemy not only failed in its intended purpose, but suffered one of the most humiliating defeats it had ever experienced. On shore at Saipan, the campaign was gaining momentum. The toughest objective on the island was Tapachau, a 1,500-foot mountain whose crest dominated the whole of Saipan. That crest had to be seized from the enemy at any cost. Marines and soldiers pushed the attack up its slopes for several days.
But the joint assault by the Marines and Army troops was not well synchronized. In overall command of the ground campaign on Saipan, Marine General Holland Smith was dissatisfied with the cautious forward advance of the Army troops. On June 24th, the General lived up to his nickname, Howlin' Mad, and fired the Army commander. The controversy over the Marine General's action raged as fiercely as the battle itself. At the same time, along the west coast of the island, Marines of the 2nd Division pressed into the outskirts of Garapan, capital city of the Marianas, and got their first taste of street fighting. of Chamorros, whose homes had been demolished, walked into the American lines at the first opportunity. U.S. fighting men made certain that the natives were out of harm's way. Many Chamorros had been hiding in caves for more than a week with little food and water. Some were on the edge of starvation when they came into American hands. Some Chamorros, no one knows how many, were killed in the violent battle for their island home. The natives of Saipan would not soon forget the summer of 1944. By July 7th, U.S. forces had seized the major part of the island. Early that morning, the Japanese made a large-scale bonsai charge against the U.S. position. The frenzied Japanese drove deep into American lines, into territory held by U.S. artillery. The charge was finally stopped in a bitter hand-to-hand -hand struggle. More than 2,000 Japanese were killed. Faced with the loss of their island base, they had chosen to die as a tribute to their emperor in the tradition of the Bushido Code. Enemy resistance on Saipan had been almost completely eliminated. Most of the 30,000 enemy troops had been killed or captured. Virtually all of Saipan, almost to the northern tip at Marpy Point, was now in U.S. possession. Before starting to clean out the remaining area, American forces waited while one last appeal was made to the enemy troops to surrender. Any natives holed up in the area were advised to come into the American lines immediately. Several dozen Chamorros were convinced that they would not be tortured and killed as the enemy had told them and took advantage of the last opportunity to move into the U.S. held territory. Finally, the attack was launched against the last piece of enemy held ground on Saipan. A few more enemy soldiers joined their ancestors. In the closing days of the battle, the number of enemy prisoners was swelled to more than a thousand. But for every Japanese soldier who surrendered, there were many more who refused to give up. Some of the natives chose suicide. On July 9th, the U.S. controlled all of Saipan. On the southern tip of the island, U.S. artillery pounded Tinian, three miles distant. 
After two weeks breather, the two Marine Divisions assaulted Tinian. The second Marine Division, in an effective feint, drew the enemy's attention to the southern beaches, while 4th Division Marines went ashore to the north and drove down the island against scattered resistance. Back from their fake landing, 2nd Division Marines followed the 4th Division Marines ashore on the northwest coast. The carefully executed diversionary movement had succeeded in fooling the enemy and throwing his defensive forces off balance. The 2nd Division Marines also landed against little or no opposition. Tinian has been termed by some military historians the perfect operation. The drive south by the two Marine Divisions was as well coordinated as the invasion maneuver. The enemy's defense of Tinian lasted for only nine days. Aware that their elite army units on Saipan had been wiped out, the Japanese forces on Tinian almost seemed reconciled to their eventual defeat. To the south of Saipan and Tinian, another U.S. amphibious force had moved into position for the assault on Guam on July 21st. Navy warships provided the customary overture to the invasion. Guam was one of the first areas seized by the enemy in December 1941. Marines of the 3rd Division and the 1st Provisional Brigade made the assault on the island. Opposition to the landing was moderate to heavy. The fight to regain Guam looked as though it would be a bloody one. After two and a half dark years, the long-awaited liberation of America's island outpost was finally at hand. As the campaign continued, the assault Marines were reinforced by the Army's 77th Division. On Guam, the Marines and soldiers worked together well in a closely knit operation. The battle against a stubborn enemy on Guam lasted for 21 days. The three major islands in the Marianas had been successfully seized. The Marines were especially gratified at retaking the old Marine Corps base on the island. The natives, Chamorros, who had grown up under American rule until 1941, were again safely in U.S. hands. By late September, Guam had been pretty thoroughly cleaned out. The capital city, Aganya, had been hit hard during the bitter struggle for the island. Guam's recent history had been superimposed on the evidences of its Spanish heritage. On Guam, as at Saipan and Tinian, the battle for the island was concluded with a familiar ceremony. On all three islands in the Marianas, some 5,000 Marines and soldiers lost their lives in the campaign designed to hasten materially the end of the war with Japan. But for these thousands, the war was already at an end. With the major islands in the strategically important Marianas in U.S. possession, the high brass, charged with directing the conduct of the Pacific War, moved into the area to prepare for the knockout blows against Japan itself. And the most important items in the planning for the delivery of those knockout blows were the Marianas airstrips. On every newly won island in the Pacific, readying the airstrip was always a top priority assignment. But in the Marianas, that job had a special urgency. For from the improved airfields on Saipan, Tinian, and Guam, America's new superfortresses, the powerful B-29s, 
would soon take off on missions against the enemy's home islands. On the Asiatic mainland, the conduct of the war against Japan was complicated by quite different problems. China, Burma, and India comprised one of the forgotten areas of the war. Come on. 